The day from New York. The state Geraldine Ferraro calls home, and the Democrats must win to win. I am Marvin Kelb. I'm Roger Mudd. And we welcome you to another edition of this special political series, Meet the Press, Decision 84. We're focusing on the campaign and the candidates. And this morning, we have one of the four major candidates with us. Geraldine Ferraro, the Democrat who wants to be vice president and who believes in many things, she says, but not in polls. She recently said, after polls indicating a Reagan landslide, I go slightly berserk when I see that people think that Reagan is a leader. Well, apparently, many people still do. The latest NBC News analysis of newspaper and political polls in many states shows little change in the president's huge lead in the critical electoral vote count even after the recent debates. But we're told it's too soon to tell the true impact of those debates. Reagan still leads in 27 states with 14 others leaning toward him, a projected electoral vote count of 443. This past week, West Virginia became a state leading toward Reagan. Iowa, which was leaning toward Reagan, is now considered contestable. Mondale can still count on victory only in the District of Columbia. In nine states, it's considered he's got a chance. This morning, the New York Daily News says that Mondale has cut into Reagan's lead in New York State. In the past three weeks, it was 14 points. It's now down to four. So, Roger, it seems as though something seems to be bubbling out there, and the polls might not yet have caught up. What's bubbling is that the Republicans finally had a bad week this last week, and it all started when the president, the man they call the great communicator, failed to communicate in his debate with Walter Mondale in Louisville. The Republicans immediately began looking for someone or something to blame. The president himself blamed Walter Mondale's makeup. If I had as much makeup on as he did, I'd look younger, too. You didn't have any makeup on? No, I never did wear it. I didn't wear it when I was in pictures. Senator Paul Laxalt said, no, it wasn't the makeup that was to blame, it was the president's staff. The reason he had an off night is not because of any general physical or mental deficiency, not at all. The plain fact of the matter is, as I analyze it, he was brutalized by a process, a briefing process, that didn't make sense. But the Democrats said it wasn't the staff and it wasn't the makeup, it was Mr. Reagan himself, and his performance, they said, proved he was getting old. The media and Democrats, like Congressman Tony Coelho of California, had a field day. The question from the reporter was, do you think that the president was old and doddering and drooling? And I rose to the defense of the president. I said he wasn't drooling. Then on Thursday, our guest today, Geraldine Ferraro, debated Vice President Bush. Whether she won or lost, most politicians thought she was not pushed around. Welcome to Meet the President, Ms. Ferraro. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, do you think Ronald Reagan is too old to be president? No, I, I think that's up for the, to the American people to decide. Um, I think they're going to have another look at the president and uh, Walter Mondale on the 21st. They're going to see them on foreign policy and arms control. I think what they uh, want to know is whether or not the uh, president really does uh, grasp the subjects and whether or not he is leading this nation in the right direction with his policies. I think those are the issues. But well, what do you think? Do you think he grasps, has a grasp on the issues sufficient well, I, to be I'm, president? Let before? me say that after watching uh, what's been happening over the past four years, and let's take specifically arms control. Uh, this is the first president since Herbert Hoover not to meet with his Soviet counterpart. He is, he's opposed every single arms control agreement ever negotiated by any president, Republican or Democrat alike. He has, he's the first president since the dawn of the nuclear age not to negotiate an arms control agreement on his own. That's the type of thing. I mean, whether or not he grasps what arms control is and what it means to this nation and our security, that's the question that I have. Well, the, the question that an awful lot of practicing politicians have, and voters also, is in fact whether he's competent to go through four more years. The issue, in fact, was raised by his performance a week ago. Immediately, Democrats and Republicans said he, he didn't have the old ball control. There's something the matter there. America saw uh, Ronald Reagan. They weren't uh, prepared for Now, my question is, do you think that age is now, or his competence is now, a legitimate issue that you can talk about? Um, you're not going to push me to answer that, uh, Roger. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that, quite frankly, I think that if you take a look at where he's been on the issues and take a look at, at how he has dealt with them, uh, you can determine that for yourself, whether or not a person has a grasp of the issues. Again, take another issue. Look on the domestic side, the deficit. He keeps saying we're going to grow out of these deficits. That is not going to happen. There is no economist, no reputable economist, who agrees with him. 
Um, and does he exercise the leadership to show us exactly what he's going to do? Or does he walk around saying things like, we're strong, you know, things are okay, things are... Is that really having a grasp on what's going on in this country? Well, why, why are you, uh, Ms. Farrar, afraid to talk about the issue, you and Walter Mondale, and, and it's left to your uh, subordinates to uh, quietly to well, move that issue about? I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think the conclusion of whether or not a person is competent should be mine to make or any other candidates. I mean, that's up to the American people. Um, the debate on Thursday night, uh, people were saying to me that I was subdued and I should have been feisty for our... Uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to convey to the American public who I am and what I'm about and whether or not I can be a leader. Leave the conclusion to them. And again, on the age thing, that's their conclusion. Taking a look at, at his policies, taking a look at his plans, taking a look at his performance to determine whether or not he is confident. That's a conclusion I don't want to draw. Uh, oh, uh, several weeks ago, before your getting ready for your debate with Mr. Mm -hmm. Bush, you said uh, that you thought the stakes for George Bush would be higher Thursday night. And uh, you said uh, that because you thought it might affect his chances and his prospects in 1988. What effect do you think uh, the debate had on George Bush for 1988? Um, I think um, I think his uh, total support of the president uh, is going to be a bothersome thing for him in 1988. Uh, he embraced wholeheartedly the whole right-wing philosophy that has driven this administration over the past four years, and that is part of their platform. I think he's going to have a problem with that in 1988. I think also um, uh, his response. Let me let me say that that had I in the course of that debate ever refused to go forth with another rebuttal um, and had said, instead of doing that, let's talk about uh, the U.S. Open today. I would have been creamed, absolutely creamed by the press and by everybody else looking at that debate. I think that hurt George Bush, too. We'll continue our questioning with you, Ms. Ferraro, in just a minute. Meet the Press, the world's longest-running television program, is a presentation of NBC News. Meet the Press is sponsored by the Archer Daniels Midland Company. ADM, helping America use its abundance to meet the world's needs. Every second of every day, there are three new mouths in this world to feed. Nearly two billion more by the year 2000. And 90% of them will be born in countries where malnutrition is already reaching alarming proportions. Right now, the world has the food and the resources to conquer hunger. But it won't happen as long as we continue to look the other way. Over the years, a lot of small businesses have developed their own systems of communicating. Yes, sir. Eric, to but Eric. now there's a better way. Meet the Merlin system from AT&T. Merlin's a telephone, an intercom, a conference caller, and has dozens of features you can select. So yes, Merlin can grow as your small business grows. Yes. Call about Merlin. AT&T Information Systems, when you've got to be right. We are back, Roger and I, with the Democratic vice presidential candidate, Geraldine Ferraro. Ms. Ferraro, I'd like to ask you about the Middle East for a moment. Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres was here last week. We know that the United States has given $2.6 billion in aid to Israel. It is authoritatively leaked that the Israelis want $4 billion next year. Would you support that? Yeah, I was uh, listening to uh, uh, Prime Minister Peres. He indicated that he is happy now with what he has, but he will be coming back for more assistance. The reason, quite frankly, is the, the state of their economy. Uh, and the fact that they have to put so much of their uh, money into defense and uh, so much of their budget into defense. You would support a $4 billion I would support budget. whatever Israel needed in order to make sure that it was able to defend itself and continue its uh, ability to maintain its security. Do you feel that for that kind of money that there ought to be a diplomatic quid pro quo extracted from Israel? That is to say, American policy towards the West Bank has always been that there has to be some kind of territorial compromise there in the long-range interests of an overall solution. The Israeli policy, at least in the last government, and at this point it's ambiguous, um, does not follow the American lead there. Do you feel that the Israelis should be more accommodating on the West Bank issue? 
I think the Israelis um, and uh, the United States should push for, uh, along with the Arab na neighbors there, for the completion of the Camp David process with reference to the West Bank, the Gaza. Uh, I think what the Reagan administration did when they came out with the Reagan plan uh, was attempt to push Israel into making a determination on the West Bank and actually removing one of its negotiating tools. Um, I don't think that that was right. I think that what you do is you move with the West, with the, within the uh, negotiating process of Camp David. I think that that's a, a point that Israel uh, can make a determination on in order to get uh, peace in that area and to maintain her own borders. Do you believe that the Palestinian people should have a homeland? No, that neither Fritz nor I support uh, an independent homeland for the uh, Palestinians. Uh, what the primary concern is, is how do we get peace in that area? How do we get uh, the Arab neighbors to recognize that Israel has a right to exist and should exist? I think that's our first focus. Do you believe that there should be a territorial compromise on the West Bank in order to get some kind of diplomatic motion? I think that that's, again, something that should be determined by Israel and our neighbors. And we have no say on it at all? You know, the thing is, we have had a say. We attempted, I think, in the last administration through Camp David to exert a bit of influence in that area. This administration has failed to do anything. It does not have a Middle East negotiator. President Reagan has not taken any personal interest in what's going on there. We have an interest, but I, I think that we have to work to maintain uh, the security of Israel. And I think that that's, that's a prime focus uh, of uh, what's going on in the Middle East, or should be. Mrs. Ferraro, would a Mondale Ferraro administration bring pressure on the uh, Thatcher government uh, to withdraw Great Britain from the six counties of Ulster and allow unification to go ahead? I think uh, what the Mondale Ferraro administration would do is uh, seek to work uh, within the Irish Forum with their, right now, they're attempting to negotiate a peaceful solution to that region. Uh, again, of the world, uh, we do not support the activities, the terrorist activities certainly that are going on now by the IRA. And what we would uh, hope to do is uh, see that there'd be a peaceful solution to the problems. Again, that's another place. Uh, we're a special envoy. It uh, could be important. A again, this administration has done absolutely nothing. It's walked away. In fact, if You're you take a look... you special let envoy me, Let me suggest Ireland? this. It, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Uh, someone to go in there and uh, attempt to assist in negotiations. What's happened is currently is we have throughout the, the world at least 13 hotspots. We have 2 million people dying as we sit here today. Uh, this administration has done virtually nothing to exert a little bit of influence in any of these regions. I mean, take the Middle East. Um, well, our policies over the past four years have failed. We're no longer in there. Syria is now in charge of Lebanon. And what have been our accomplishments? Absolutely nothing. Uh, if you take a look at South Africa, we've done nothing at all uh, to change those uh, policies. The Philippines, look what's happening in that, in that country. We have the vice president going there and toasting Marcus as the great defender of democracy. And we've done nothing as a superpower uh, to ward off uh, the problems that are, that are being faced throughout the world. I think we have to move in and start, pick our places. I don't think you can be all over the world. But I think you have to pick your places and say, hey, look, this is where we have to assist uh, the governments and, and exert some power as a superpower uh, to make a, a decision. Are you now prepared, Ms. Ferraro, to accept uh, as fact that the American college students on the island of Grenada were in danger and that was justification for the invasion or uh, rescue operation? Well. Fritz Mondial and I do not agree about this. He is ready to because he has some information with reference to those students' lives that I do not have. He didn't share that with you? Well, I never bothered to go and find out after because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a fact that is completed. <coughs> Uh, I mean, let if, me, if they let were me in danger, you. Shouldn't, you, uh, shouldn't you have found out if, about it? Well, if they were in danger, I would have, you know, and it were a place where I would be making a decision. Uh, I assume that I would have been privy to the information uh, as president or vice president. I was not privy to that information as a member of Congress. I came out against the invasion uh, when it occurred. I have not gone further and pursued... But he's with... left you hanging, hasn't no, 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 not at all. And, and that's just not a fact. Um, let me say this, that for two years this administration had had the government of Grenada attempting to come in and, and speak with our administration. Uh, they were looking for help, they were looking for assistance, the administration turned around and did nothing. All of a sudden, in and invade. You know, our students were not there for a week, they were there for years. The administration could have moved ahead, could have negotiated, could have gotten them out. 
That's my problem with what went on. This administration moves militarily first and then says, well, we were justified in doing it. Maybe they were justified. And again, I don't have that information. Not because anybody didn't want to share it for me, because I did not proceed. The invasion is over. It's a fait accompli. It was last year's, you know, it had been done last year. Would I have done the same thing? No. I would have moved ahead and tried to speak with the government during those two years uh, to see what could have been done instead of moving in with force first. That should be our last resort, and Fritz and I both agree on that. Mr. Farrell, we'll be back with more questions just after these messages. Chrysler introduces the new technology of driving. Turbo New Yorker, front wheel drive, electronics to inform you. Chrysler Luxury to comfort you and Turbo Power to move you. Turbo New Yorker. Once you drive it, you'll never go back to a V8 again. This is Chrysler's most technologically advanced luxury car, backed by the Chrysler Protection Plan. Turbo New Yorker by Chrysler. The best built, best backed American cars. Which computer company is making more room in the computer room? A company with the technology to build a computer system that's more powerful and more reliable than its older cousins, but a whole lot smaller. That company is NCR. Hello! Your new computer's here! Their computer's everything the big computers were, except big. Innovative computer technology. You can expect it from NCR. We are back with Geraldine Ferraro. Ms. Ferraro, um, could you push the nuclear button? I can do whatever is necessary in order to protect the security of this country. Including that? Yeah. You also said a couple of days ago that if there were a time when your religious beliefs interfered with your professional duty, you'd resign. That's right. Could you help us understand what kinds of issues could emerge of that nature? I, I don't know. Um, let me say that uh, if I were ever at the point where, where my, if my church, and this is what I, I really mean by this, if my church were to say to me, because you are not supporting my, our position on, say, the issue of abortion, um, we will, we would remove you, we would excommunicate you, excommunicate, I would leave my public job, I would not allow that to happen. Uh, that's, that's really basically where I'm coming from. So that's an action by the church. By the church. Mm -hmm. I'm confused, uh, or maybe I haven't studied it sufficiently, about your, uh, about your explanation of your abortion vote. If abortion you regard as morally wrong, and as a Catholic do not support, and at the same time do not want to impose your views on others, uh, don't really, uh, when you vote in the House, don't, aren't you always imposing your views on others about school busing, about uh, tuition tax credits? Isn't every vote an impos imposition of your views? Well, I, th I think you bring your own, obviously, your own moral judgments and your views to what you do. Sure you do. Um, my views on abortion um, are views that I accept because my church uh, has indicated its position on it. I accept them for myself personally. Do I, you know, can I prove that, uh, that a, uh, an fertilized egg is a human being? No, I can't. Neither can anybody else scientifically. But because we can't, my church teaches that there is a presumption of life. I will accept the teachings of my church and I will go by the rules of my church for my own life. I have a lot of friends who do not accept that premise. But you accept and it. I accept it. It's my, and so for, uh, for me, I would never have an abortion. But again, too, let me just be very, very honest. I, I would never have one, but if I were ever to become pregnant as a result of a rape, I don't know what I'd do. I, I really don't know what I do, but that decision I would want to leave to me. It is the law of the land that it is, that it is legal, and that decision would be mine. That's all I'm saying, is but, that the choice is just to be somebody else, whoever is the one who makes the decision. But by raising the question and indicating that there was doubt about what you would do, you do, uh, uh, it sounds to me as if you would say you would have an abortion in that case. I say I, I w would not make the decision until a while we're in that spot. I don't know. I really don't know what I would do, um, but I, I want to make that decision. I wouldn't want you making that decision for me. Ms. Ferraro, I want to do it myself. You are obviously a highly intelligent person and a very attractive candidate. But for those people out there who want to know why you feel you should be a vice president, could you help us out? 
Gee, I thought I did that during the course of the debate. <laughs> um, there, for, no, there's several reasons why I want to be vice president. One of which is that why should uh, you be? All right. Terms of qualification. Qualification. Let me let me start first of all with the first question, which is why I want to be one. one number one, because I think the administration's policies are wrong, whether it's on arms control or it's on you know, foreign policy or it's on domestic policy. I think Lots they're wrong. We've got to move. And therefore, I want to be there helping Fritz von Dale to to change things around and really lead us into the future. My qualifications, I think, are, are more than paper qualifications, and those aren't bad either. You know, I was a teacher, I was a prosecutor, um, I've spent six years in Congress, so I know the issues. The other thing, though, is when I'm, when I'm not sure of something, I know how to reach out to somebody who does know them, take what they give me, weigh it, and make the decisions. I'm capable of making tough decisions, I'm capable of dealing honestly, I'm capable of leveling with the American public. I'm capable of dealing, again, the hard things I'm willing to do. And if you weren't a woman, do you think you'd have been selected? Oh, if I weren't a woman, I, woman, I don't think I'd have had the opportunity that I've had in Congress to do as much as I've done. That's fair. Uh, well, there are some negatives to it, too. I mean, it's not all positive. That's a double-edged sword. Uh, so that, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if I, were, if I were not a woman, if I would be judged in the same way in my candidacy, whether or not I'd be asked questions like, you know, are you strong enough to push the button, or you know that type? No, that of is a kind of question that we have asked on this program of men. Yeah. Yes, we're yeah. really quite even handed okay. about the subject. Okay. Why did you vote for the MX, which you say you don't like, in 1980, and then voted against it in '81? Because in 1980, uh, there was a different basing mode for it. It was a basing mode that was survivable, at least more survivable than the basing mode that President Reagan suggested. President Reagan has suggested hardening silos that are currently uh, in place, the mid and silos. They're vulnerable. So it's just the basing mode? The basing mode, the particularly, the, the basing mode particularly uh, bothers me because it is vulnerable. I spent a lot of time, before I made my decision not to vote for the MX missile, I spent a lot of time people, speaking with people from the Pentagon because the main point, for, the main, uh, point that is necessary for a missile is that it be defensive and that it be, it be vul it not subject to, uh, to um, being vulnerable, be invulnerable, but you can't have it totally invulnerable. But in any event, they said to me that it was vulnerable. So if it's vulnerable, why build it? Instead of something like that, uh, you know, the Midget Man is a, a much more survivable missile, and that's what we support. The, the what man? The Midget Man uh -huh. missile. And that's a more, more survivable, a better missile. So why waste money on, on something that could be uh, eliminated by the Soviets? Uh, may I uh, ask a, a short political question? Sure. What do you think uh, the effect has been on uh, the uh, Bush campaign of the repeated comments about you, most of which rhyme with which? Oh, I don't know. Um, well, you got to. I mean, they were directed at you, Ms. Ferraro. You, you yeah, well, I don't know what. I don't, well, I have an opinion what, on what it, but I don't, I don't know what the effect on the Bush campaign What's your is. What's opinion? Um, my opinion is that, um, well, there's several things. I guess my reaction I is. Do it quickly. <laughs> do it quickly. My reaction is that perhaps they're beginning to get a little worried when they see the polls moving. That's the type of thing that that starts occurring out of the Bush campaign or out of the Reagan campaign, whenever we start seeing the movement in the polls, which you referred to. The other thing is, um, I think it might be a, a bit of a statement on, you know, my candidacy, who am I to uh, challenge uh, this man. So put down. Uh, I think it is. Ms. Ferrara, thank you very much for being our guest thank today you. on Meet the Press. We've enjoyed having you here. Thank you. Roger and I will be back after these messages. Roger, I said last week that the debates represent a kind of screwy way to run a railroad, but they're clearly terribly important. The Mondale people got energized as a result of the debate last Sunday. They picked up a lot of money. They are so important, as a matter of fact, and our role in it, the media's role in it, is so critical that I would think that maybe a little bit of humility on our part in calling winners and losers might be a sensible way to go about it. Well, that is, uh, that is a critical uh, role the media plays, and sometimes I think uh, we perhaps overplay it. But uh, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of this coming uh, debate, the Mondale-Reagan uh, debate in Kansas City. Uh, it is uh, the central act of this coming, uh, this coming election, and uh, the pressure will be on Ronald Reagan to show America the Reagan it was used to over the last four years, not the one they saw a week ago. Well, that is, that is for sure, and that is it for now because our time is up. Thank you all for joining us. Next Sunday, we're going to be back broadcasting live from Kansas City, the site of the next and the crucial presidential debate. I am Marvin Kalb with Roger Mudd saying goodbye for Meet the Press from New York. Hope to see you next Sunday.
For a printed transcript of Meet the Press, send $1 and a stamped self-addressed envelope to Kelly Press, Box 8648, Washington, D.C., 20011. Meet the Press has been sponsored by the Archer Daniels Midland Company, ADM, helping America use its abundance to meet the world's needs. The sun never sets on the world of news. While you're asleep, tomorrow's headlines are being made. Join Connie Chung for NBC News at sunrise and catch up with the world. News, features, timely interviews, weather and sports reports, and unique entertainment. They're all part of the Today program every weekday morning. Start your day with us on Today, right here on NBC. This is Howard Reed. Meet the Press is a presentation of NBC News and has come to you live from our studios in New York. I'm Jane Pauley. Tomorrow morning on Today, a report on help for men who beat their wives. Also, World Series highlights and splash star Daryl Hannah. Join us tomorrow morning on Today. From the World Series to the presidential debates, NBC News is there. When you want news from across the nation. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.